Hello and welcome to the latest edition of GRC and Cybersecurity Podcast. In today's episode, we've got a very special guest, Sam Bisbee. Some of the things we're going to cover in today's episode are uh, the dangers and some of the challenges with things like ChatGPT and other AI. It's been a pleasure speaking to him and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hi, Sam. Can you first introduce yourself and tell listeners a little bit about uh, the company you work for? So I'm Sam Bisbee. I work at F5. We are historically known for our load balancing, but we have become a application services delivery vendor, so helping customers confidently deliver whatever value they ship to their customers, whether that's from the perspective of availability or securing the app traffic coming in in and out of their environments. So before we get a little bit further, one of the things we always like to ask is, uh, what do you get up to outside of work? So have you got any interests, hobbies that you're, up to, uh, that you're into? Well, work keeps me pretty busy and I have an infinite home. So between those two things, I don't really have time for hobbies these days, but um, I'll get work-life balance uh, back again one day. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about what your current role is and tell listeners about your current role, but also like, how did you get into security? What's your, did you go traditional route? Did you study at university? It'd be great to know a little bit more. My current role, I'm in the office of the CTO. Uh, focusing on security and uh, kind of our modern applications. And so that's crossing between, you know, working with customers and, you know, kind of representing F5 externally out to the security community and industry. That includes helping secure the environment internally and working with those phenomenal teams. And then R&D, you know, lo looking into the future and seeing what, what capabilities do we need to start developing now for customers. I came into this role through the threat stack acquisition by F5, uh, where I was the uh, chief security officer, uh, building uh, the program to secure our customers as well as the product and everything else. How did I get here? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, a lot of it was kind of a misspent youth. Uh, you know, I was lucky and privileged to be in a situation where I could get into computers and technology at an early age. Came up professionally through venture back tech and the open source community and working on distributed systems. Kind of everywhere I worked, I was always responsible for security or compliance on some level. But no, no university, uh, no uh, certificates. Uh, I have a high school diploma uh, that I'm very proud of. And uh, yeah, here we are. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say no certificates. So you have, it's all been self-learned experience uh, through like, I guess all, all the different jobs and things that you've learned over time. Look, I am extremely lucky that I love what I am paid to do. I started at an extremely young age and I just wanted to know it all and do it all and just keep going. And luckily, yeah, like I said, luckily it was a field where they were going to pay me to do that. And uh, it worked out. Fantastic. It's always good to know a little bit about size and stage of the information security program. So can you tell us a little bit about F5 and I guess how their security program works? F5 is a multinational multi-product public company like i said people traditionally know f5 for its historical hardware low balancing the big ip appliance but it has gone on to acquire nginx it's gone on to develop software software as a service so that is a big complicated problem that the security team works on you know when we were at threat stack building and scaling that startup you know we were a cloud security vendor and we provide both product and services to our customers. So our security team before the acquisition was between 35 to 40 people at its largest. And that was everything from, you know, the internal platform SRE type of security to IT, GRC. Uh, and for you know, a while we built and scaled out the security services that we could use internally, but then also leverage for our customers. So we got all in the, the human security experience for the customer. So one of the things that's interesting to know, where do you report in the organization? So who do you report to? And do you have a team of direct reports that report to you? Yeah, so at the time uh, for that program that I described, I was reporting to the CEO as the chief security officer, and I had about three to five direct reports and then uh, the rest of the team. Since I've moved into the office of the CTO uh, at F5, it's interesting. I don't have any direct reports and I report to the CTO and VP for kind of security and applications, a bunch of other components. So it's been a big, weird gear shift for me 
career-wise, you know, going from that operational life where I could point to any day on a calendar and tell you what I was probably doing on that day, reactive work aside, to now thinking and working on, you know, two to five year look ahead. And it's uh it's refreshing to shift gears like that. Yeah, I can imagine. It's I guess it's you get to get, do a bit more of the long term thinking rather than just the day to day managing from day to day to make sure you're keeping the lights on. I, I miss the organizational development and working with people side. I think people who have managed people before will know that uh, it's not a disparaging comment to say that it's it's nice to take a break. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's refreshing in some ways. But uh, yeah. yeah, I can I can agree with some of that. So what is the area that you're spending most of your time in the more at the moment? So what are the areas of cyber where you're really focusing on? Security is an interesting conversation at five because we have such a wide swath of different types of customers you know you have those who are still fairly early in the digital transformation journey for their own businesses and then you have extremely modern high-tech companies and kind of everything in between and so security is an interesting conversation trying to translate that down into all of those different types of environments where i'm personally spending a lot of that time is looking at new ways of building proactive security models so instead of constantly kind of firefighting and chasing you know whether it be bad ip addresses or more vulnerabilities or you know it, it's an important part of security programs that i appreciate that there are people who enjoy collecting all the bad things and enumerating all that it's just something I have never enjoyed. And so I'm trying to make the inverse of that a little bit easier and more cost effective. So normally this is where we do a bit of a deep dive subject. But one of the things that you want to talk about was like a common definition of threat intelligence and IP address data. Do you want to explain to the listeners, I've probably murdered that, but it'd be great for you to kind of <laughs> explain uh, that topic and we can do a bit of a deep dive on it. Yeah, sure. So you know, whether you're talking about you know application vulnerabilities, people are constantly talking about software field and materials and S bombs now, or you're chasing CVEs or IP addresses or whatever it is, there's an epic amount of time and money spent on that. And even if you take out the entire vendor ecosystem of that, just think about all of the people hours that are going into just enumerating all the things that you will never patch or that you will never block or that you will never see happen in the environment. It's kind of depressing. This is not easy in all technical environments, but I've long held the belief that it is a more fulfilling and direct path to go understand how your environment behaves versus how you expect it to behave and go start to put those machine policies in place uh, to go and finish that. So, you know, if you have a server that should only be talking to AWS, it should be trivial to go configure your network to only let traffic go to AWS. But any operations or IT team will tell you just how painful an experience it is to go actually define and maintain a firewall in that state. A lot of this comes back to the observability conversation around you actually understand what your environment does and how it's supposed to behave. And the engineering teams largely do. They have all the security policies locked up in their config management, whether it be Chef or, you know, their HashiCorp Terraform products or whatever it is. So how can we start to extract that knowledge from all of those operational assets and start to go build that into proactive security controls? Yeah, I think a lot of that comes back to contextualizing things, doesn't it? I think one of the things that people often, and then one of the things you said there before is like, you got lots and lots and lots of data and warnings, but like what actually matters is the difficult bit. And I think if you think about this, it's like, it, it's taking that data in and then going, how do I make sense of it in a sensible way? Cause I think so many organizations get struggle with the volume of data and go, I just don't really know where to start. So I think what you're saying is actually let, let's look at what we do. <laughs> and flip that on its head rather than just say, let's take all the data in. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, it's, you know, if you look at the CVE side, how many teams are having to go in and triage CVEs that com are completely unrelated to their environment? Like it, it creates kind of a, a unfortunate relationship between the security or GSC side and then over into the teams that they're supporting. And what would happen if you instead went and invested some of that time into figuring out how you could automatically upgrade software in the environment. Or, I don't know, it's an activity versus results uh, conversation in my mind where 
it's not that going and scanning and listing bad things is a waste of time. I think it is a overinvestment. And that's especially concerning when you've got all these very small security teams or your entire security team is actually just IT. And where, you know, do you want them going and digging through miles and miles of PDFs and Excel files? Or do you want them going out and figuring out, okay, how could we start to automatically patch the server? And the server context is critical. So I'm not talking about auto patching, like implanted medical devices or jet engines or something. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Because kind of you're flipping this on its head and going like, what do good security controls look like? How are they in place and how are we monitoring them rather than just going, let's just fix everything, which is like, actually let's, I guess that can flip us a little bit onto compliance then, because I guess compliance, maybe good security controls, but like, do you see things like basically developing continuous monitoring for what good security controls look like? as being like a way of kind of saying, actually, that's maybe where we should be focusing on top of obviously patching the things that make sense? Uh, short answer is yes. You know, inside of the ThreatSec security team, we often talked, uh, or there was a quote that we copied and pasted around a lot, which was that uh, good security is fundamentally indistinguishable from good operations. Like all the things that when you read through uh, this cybersecurity framework or, or any of these kind of maturity and hygiene models, it's very easy to look and just kind of say, well, yeah, like that that is something that you should do. I think the hard part is for a whole bag of historical reasons, security teams have gone off and felt that they needed to build separate from the rest of the organization. And that got really expensive. You know, there are organizations where that hundreds to thousands of people, central security and GRC organization can exist. That's not most environments. And so, for example, why do you need to go in and develop, you know, unique scanning technologies or bring in scanning vendors if you have a list of all your software is just you know in your config management solution or why do you need to go acquire a dedicated cmdb solution when you've got you know chef and puppet sitting right over there or you've got aws's apis telling you here's all your inventory so it's it, it's security is not special it's a specialty and in so many of these environments we should be going in and figuring out okay what exists in this environment and how can I leverage that to go adhere to this compliance framework or um, the security controls? And I feel like there's too much cargo culting in all of that, I guess is the short answer. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think people have always seen like, let's just buy more things, buy more things, buy more things. And you end up with like, I guess it comes back to lots of information, but I guess it's the, so what? It's like, okay, so how am I, how is that improving? Like you said, operations, how is that making me more secure? Because if, if you can't validate why that's happening, it's like, well, we probably shouldn't be investing in this technology or new thing. I think that ultimately is what it comes back to. And it, it's true on the GRC side too, right? And yeah. I feel like some of this is starting to shift, but I'm having a hard time coming up with an example from compliance because there's so many. But, you know, uh, regular firewall and access reviews, something yeah. like that. There is value in that activity because even if you have a bunch of automation, automation sometimes doesn't work. And so you need to go in and be able to do a manual review occasionally. But, you know, if you've invested in some level of automation, I don't know the value of going and manually walking through every firewall rule versus saying, well, it's in a machine config file that's in Git that has automated checks on it. Here's our audit log. Like everybody's threat model is different. And so there are situations where you might not be able to rely on that on every deployed firewall, but like you can probably get pretty close. And so where can you go direct those people hours instead of going and crawling through all those lines every every single month or quarter? I think that this is where it's going, right? I mean, and we see it all the time is this, let's call it continuous security assurance or continuous control monitoring, whatever you want to call it. But it's these tools now either built yourself or that are doing it where you're going and retrieving the exact cut like again what you said there can even be policy ones where it's going to a document repository pulling the latest policy making sure it's been updated and reviewed so it can be all kinds of different things but i think so many business stakeholders spent you have spent so much well it people have been asked can i have a copy of this policy can you tell me that and it's every single compliance requirement or other thing for every audit and they're just like <laughs> i feel like i've been asked 15 times of the same thing <laughs> 
yeah they just spend their life like going okay and it's like we've got to make this better and it's I think first of all personally aligning frameworks creating meta frameworks or overarching security principles which meet all of those because I mean I literally spoke about this the other day but it was like if you take a password control or a policy control how many variants of it is there across every single one of the compliance requirements that you have to meet how many audits you have to do a year and then there's the poor person who's the owner of that policy who's asked 15 times throughout the year for the evidence it's it's crazy right and taking that step back and then automating it think of the amount of time you're saving just from that one person it you can end up saving a large proportion of your security team's time to focus on adding value rather than just making sure we're meeting these requirements yeah absolutely and especially when you start to think about you know a uh, b2b type uh, you know business to business type of vendor relationship where you know as you start expanding out you know in the us if you start working with those in the payment and banking areas is like how many different variations of password policies since you mentioned it are you going to see and I'm sure that if you just kind of like dig through enough decades of paper, you're going to find some like 50 year old FINRA requirement that was completely outdated then, let alone now, you know, it, and so it's, it is painful trying to go manage all that. And you just look at it and you're like, okay, but like, how are you actually understanding the risk in this relationship? Like you're not. And so therefore we're just going to sit here and have this conversation, this inane conversation of just reading through a checklist of things without anybody understanding what's actually going on whether that be at the intent of the control level or how the thing is used what we're describing is difficult to scale so that's where the yeah. automation a lot of reporting all this stuff comes in but it also comes down to the you know can you start to actually understand what you're consuming why you're consuming it and how that impacts your business like you probably don't need to go drag every martech vendor through a massive week-long audit and yeah martech is a generally terrible industry from a security and compliance point of view so you might want to take a little bit of a look but like understand what the thing is you're actually trying to assess or secure yeah <laughs> no I, I, it, it's so true isn't it i think like there's some of these requirements can become quite it's the intent of the control. I think the words that you said there is it's like, what is the intent of this? Is there a reasonable mitigation that we think is in place? Because I think sometimes it's somebody not just being a pure auditor and saying, is this in place? Yes, no. Well, yes, no, that's not in place, but we're doing these three other things more than enough to fill the intent of that control. And this comes down to good thought about good security objectives, good control objectives. What are they trying to do? And then allowing the business to make sensible decisions or the security team to make sensible decisions on adequate, adequate controls to meet that risk. But compliance doesn't always work in that way, does it? And a lot of people want, well, it doesn't say that. <laughs> and that's where you get unstuck. Yes. And now how the heck do we just go scale what we just described, right? Because this is this can be tricky at a large organization with fairly modern creative thinking and uh, on security and compliance, but you know, how does a five person IT or DevOps team that also has to go do SOC 2 and PCI and all these other things it is one of the places where I get encouraged by all the service providers in cloud and SaaS. Like it's a it's this interesting thing where the the really large companies who can afford the large security and compliance practices are so slow and concerned to adopt a lot of these solutions. But for the other 95% of companies out there, they probably should go adopt them because any risk that they're taking into their environment that they don't know about is probably better than all the really fundamental risks that they can't operationalize and take care of themselves. So I guess flipping back a bit more into your role then. So can you tell me like, what are, I guess, some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing, be that be specific to the industry or your role? I would say biggest issue right now is just how much noise continues to be created in the security community versus the things the security practitioners are actually trying to go and invest in. The number of conversations I've had about generative AI and chat GPT in the last couple of months, for example, right? it's interesting, you know, if AI progresses and starts delivering on all the promises that it's making, 
then that's really compelling. And from a business risk perspective, you should probably adopt it sooner rather than later so you don't get left behind. Yeah, it can write phishing emails and do write bad code and all these things. All technology is dual use is kind of my takeaway on that one. Meanwhile, security practitioners are trying to understand what are all the things they're running, uh, what's running on them, uh, do they have headcount? Like it, the, the, the things that we think security teams should be investing in versus the things that security teams actually need to invest in. It's a big delta. You know, we spoke about this, but like the chat GPT thing is like, <laughs> there's, there's so many things that people like it. It's businesses like just like probably like some people are just saying you can't use it for business. And it's like, okay, but the reality is it's just going to be used. You kind of have to get on board with this and understand the risks of it a bit. Because I think saying now, <laughs> I think the analogy that some people use like was the cloud one. where <laughs> It's like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Da, 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 da. Ten years later, well, everyone's done it. So I think this might be very similar where it's just going to get embedded everywhere. And I think it's just like making sure that you think about how it's going to be used and that it's been used in the correct way early. I think it is a very apt parallel. I think the only difference is that AI is going to be a larger uh, gap to cross and it is going to move faster. So, you know, AWS launched SQS in 2004, EC2 and S3 in 2006. And for sake of discussion, let's say that that was kind of, you know, quote, the birth of public cloud. That means if you are still pulling off your lift and shift cloud migration, you've effectively accepted 20 years of opportunity cost. And like it's going to take you more than 20 years to catch up if your competitor adopted earlier on, right? This AI stuff, like it is already exists in some form. If it continues delivering and maturing, it's only going to deliver more and more quickly. You're not going to have that time to catch up. And the other similarity is, you know, security, IT, legal, compliance, just a no, 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 God, no, please, no, all the way along this curve. And meanwhile, you know, some app developer or, you know, head of engineering or whatever that, well, you need me to hit this date and I can ship on that date, but I need to just go swipe a credit card and do this cloud thing. So I'm just going to go do that with or without the blessing. They were rewarded for it because they did it faster, it was better, like cost was lower. That's happening with ChatGPT, right? How many legal and compliance and security teams are emailing out to their employee base saying, don't use this, you're not allowed to use this. Well, whether or not an app developer is using ChatGPT to generate production code, is a, that's a bit of a different conversation. But like, you think your sales team or marketing team or somebody else isn't going in and having ChatGPT generate emails for them, like confidential proprietary information from your company is already an open AI systems. That is a probably a reasonable statement to make. So it's not, should this happen or can you block it? It's how are you going to actually go deal with this? Cause it's already happened. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, I think it, it, there's no rowing back from this now, is it? It's like, it's like people have done it, especially like you say for marketing. I mean, the amount of people that will have used it for marketing messaging, probably internal things that they probably shouldn't have, have been put through it. I mean, you probably just have to educate people what it is and understand the risks and what they should and shouldn't put on it. But saying you can't do it now, is probably like, like you say, that, that, that that's gone. We said you couldn't do public cloud. Well, it happened and there's benefits. We said you couldn't bring your own devices into networks and use them for personal work. Well, it was already happening. Then mobile phone, it's happened. Then COVID, like it, we're, we're there. Like one of my favorite ones that always was here, where it is like, don't talk to family and friends about things that are happening at work. Well, that's unrealistic, right? So like in all these cases, it, it's, it's these things happen, you know, don't click on links and emails. All right, well then what's the point of email, right? And so it's, we have failed this litmus test so many times. We've been so ridiculous. And for that reason, security should not have been taken seriously for so many years. We we're just saying ridiculous things that, you know, we've taken the business under. So like, this feels like an opportunity, whether you talk about it in terms of like more discrete, easier to understand, quote unquote, machine learning, or the more extreme edge stuff like generative AI and wherever this stuff is going. But it feels like this is going to be the next train that we can get ahead of. It's like, Go in and help people figure out how to do this safely. 
how can you do this without creating undue risk? Because otherwise you're just going to get left behind and no one's going to invite you along. And, you know, then the smoking creator is going to be more likely and impactful. Yeah, I think that's the main thing, isn't it? It's like working with the business, going along with them and saying, look, just being a blocker now, I think we've all, from the points you made there, is that just doesn't work. Like people are going to do this stuff anyway. So first of all, let's have an honest conversation where they're using it so we know. <laughs> and then advise them about some place. Say probably, like you said, yeah, you definitely don't want to be using it to write code that you put on your production like that. That's, that's not a clever idea. But like, it's probably just educating them of like, look, we can use it here. You can use it here, but you need to be sensible. And to be clear, like from the code and production example, that's as much because a lot of the code it writes is terrible, right? Like the stuff is really good at getting like on written word, it can get you 80% of there. Yeah. Code much lower, but it's also the legal like intellectual property risk that you're now starting to enter. Like there's just, regardless of your opinion, there's no decisions. It's going to be an interesting ride that we go on, but what keeps it interesting? Yeah, I think I think it's definitely going to be something we're going to be talking about a lot, lot more and we'll hear. I'm sure it'll be the next thing we see on LinkedIn after everyone gets over the, uh, we've not got enough people in cyber. It's going to be. Yeah. Well, don't, don't get me spoiled with that one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> a- AI is not going to solve that problem. Um, going and hiring and finding good leaders. Like we don't have a talent shortage. We have a leadership shortage. And AI is not going to go solve that problem for us. So I can't agree more. It's give people a chance, develop people. And that's your answer, right? It's not uh, There's not enough people. It's like we're probably not willing to give people a shot and develop them. There's loads of people wanting jobs. It's just about making sure you give them a pathway to develop. So um, can you talk me through... In your view, what do you think a great information security professional? What are the skills that you look for? I don't know that I have anything super specific to security. Generally, across any role I'm looking at, it's this kind of blend of are, are they humble? That one's a hard one to find in security. But are they humble? Are they hungry? And are they intelligent? Right. The specifics of the role and the discipline can probably be taught. The mix of hunger intelligent really needs to kind of blend in security to the conversation we just had is the the desire to understand what how something works, why it works that way, that deeper level. It's, it's not that that's a must have, but that that's always a great accelerant. Like that's the big feather in the cap bonus point thing that I get excited about when I talk to somebody is like, oh, you're you're gonna go for the marrow. Okay, now now how can we go? teach you all the technical things that you might not know so that you can go and uh, actually implement something. Fantastic. So I guess the final question is if you could have one wish in security, I know this is hard. Like if you could fix one thing, what would it be? I think it would be the de-escalation of all the terrible toxic toxicity that we've had both inside the community itself, but then also working with stakeholders, right? It's going back to the, what I said earlier, which I think is a quote I'm stealing from somebody, you know, security is not special. It's a specialty and looking at security as a way to go guide and provide another pair of eyes and think about how to go build a resilient organization not a secure one, not a secure technology. How do we go build a resilient organization? That's a whole bunch of people as much as it is tech and process. But yeah, that de-escalation is necessary to kind of move that move that conversation along. So no, I don't know. I think I agree with you. I think like getting trust back and working together and open conversations would make things a lot better. Cause you're better knowing something than just like sat there going. Oh yeah, well I've told them no. I, they're definitely listening, and we all we all get. <laughs> You'd rather know this stuff and work together rather than just be literally, I guess, unaware of the things that are going on. Yeah, and that's going to become a harder and harder conversation. As you know, at least in the U.S., what we're seeing, and I think other parts EU, but where we're seeing it elsewhere too, is regulators are coming in fast and heavy, and that environment is at least changing. So I think it's reasonable to expect companies to be better at this stuff. How a company thinks about risk, especially cyber risk, is going to be fascinating because the cyber insurance industry has certainly learned that it is not as simple as other types of risk it created actuary tables on before, right? That industry is largely on fire. So it's going to be compelling. Fantastic. Well, look, Sam, uh, thanks for having you on. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
um if they want to hear more from you is linkedin the best place to to reach out to you yeah please reach out to me on linkedin and uh you know if you find yourself on f5.com you can uh find a way to reach out to me there as well thank you very much it's been great thanks sam